Okay, my name is Frank Sharp. Uh, I was born May the 2nd, 1938. Okay, I was born in Corpus Christi, Texas. And this interview is for the Farmington Oral History Project, and we just want to verify that we have your permission to use the interview. You do have my permission to use the interview. Uh, tell me, who were your parents? Okay, my parents were Roy and Mary Sharp. And tell me about your family and your siblings. Okay, I have one sister. Uh, my, my sister is Marianne Timberlake. She lives in Virginia right now. My parents, uh, my lived always in Texas and my father was 50 when he got married and he had to date every woman in Texas before he finally settled down and uh, anyway we moved here in 1943 our family moved here in 1943 okay tell me about your family business okay uh, my father was in just about every kind of business in Texas and he'd make money on one deal and he'd lose it on the next deal and uh, his last business was in Corpus Christi and he had a neon sign company actually he had the second one in Texas and uh, this was during the Second World War and a German submarine came up in the Gulf so they did a blackout on all the coast which didn't help the neon sign business so my dad and my mother for some reason decided they wanted to be, be farmers. They never farmed in their lives. And uh, my father had driven through this area years ago, years before, and decided they wanted to move to Arkansas. And uh, so they ended up buying 68 acres of rocks up here on Kessler Mountain. Uh, tell me about your business he started here in, in Arkansas. Okay, he tried, first he tried farming. And my dad had always been in business. so. He said, this farming, after a while, he said, this farming is crazy. He said, everything you buy, you buy retail, and everything you sell, you sell wholesale. He said, just the opposite of what I'm used to. So he decided he wanted to have a business that he could cons uh, handle the prices. He said, also farming, they'll tell you, we'll give you this much for your eggs, this much for your cream, and he'd like to set his own prices. And uh, we tried raising rabbits, which didn't, uh, work well at all, raising rabbits and selling the pelts and the meat. And so uh, in Corpus, he had had a smoked turkey at a party, and he thought it was really sort of interesting, but he said it was, he thought it was dry and tough and salty. And uh, we had all kind of, we had guineas and ducks and geese and turkeys and what have you. And uh, he said, well, I think I'll try it. He'd always roasted turkey. He said, I think I'll try smoking a turkey. So he went to a neighbor that uh, knew a lot about smoking meat, and he said, uh, how would you smoke a turkey? And this fellow said, well, I've never heard of smoking a turkey. Now, to smoke a ham, you'd rub it with salt and sugar for so long, hang it up, and you'd smoke it with hickory wood for so long. So my dad tried that on the turkey and said it was just as dry and tough and salty as the turkey he'd had in, in Texas. So my dad loved to cook, so he started experimenting with uh, various recipes and he'd have a big party and serve uh, uh, the turkey. And then uh, finally he developed a recipe that he liked, that everybody liked. And uh, people say, well, Roy, do one for me. And uh, next time you do one, actually he would smoke them on a homemade smoker out in our backyard, take them down to Marlon's Bakery in Farmington. The building is still there. but They had a bakery with a big bread oven and they would bake the turkeys in that bread oven after he'd smoked them. And anyway, people said, well, do one for me. So he built a little uh, lean-to off the barn, and uh, he built the, this lean-to off the barn, put a smoker, do eight turkeys at a time, and had a propane cooker on it. And uh, the first batch just worked great. Second batch, one of the turkeys fell on the propane burner, got the the smoker on fire, got the barn on fire. Luckily, we got the livestock out, but it burned to the ground. So he was sort of out of the farming and the smoking business, too. And uh, Ewing Jackson at Farmington had that, it had River Ridge, not River Ridge, uh, that was later. He had a farm at Farmington, right about where the, uh, sort of where the high school is now. And the, the barn, I mean, the buildings are still there. Anyway, he raised turkeys and, uh, 
he raised them up on slats. Back then, they didn't have antibiotics, and you, if you had large flocks of turkeys, they'd die from blackhead. So Mr. Har uh, Mr. Jackson had really good luck on growing turkeys, so they decided they'd form a partnership, and he would grow the turkeys, and my father would smoke the turkeys. And they decided to take $5,000 each to build the building and put in the smokers. And uh, my father didn't have a dime, and so he went to Buck Lewis at the First National Bank and said, said Ewing and I want to uh, start a company called Ozark Mountain Smokehouse, and we're going to want to Ewing grow the turkeys, and I'll smoke them. And Buck had had turkey at our house. They were friends. And he said, Roy, here you are in your 60s, and you have no collateral. And uh, he said, I've got an obligation to my depositors. And uh, my dad's face sort of fell, and Buck said, well, you know, my sister gave me some money and asked me to invest it for her, so we'll just use her money, not the bank's money. That was the way banking was back then. <laughs> so that's how it got started. And that was in about 40, 1946. And of course, I grew up. We ra we raised later. We raised our own turkeys. So let's talk about what was your part in the family business. Okay, uh, my first job was opening turkey gizzards, and uh, I was about nine years old, I guess. And I could open a gizzard. Have you ever opened a giz gizzard? If you have, uh, most people just cut it open and they open the gizzard and they peel the mem you know they clean all the junk out and then they peel the membrane, but I'd learned how to do it and take that whole sack out. And I know we went by Martin's Poultry and these women were opening gizzards and Roy said, my dad said, Frank, show them how we open gizzards. And I just grabbed a knife and opened that gizzard, you know. <laughs> Those women were just amazed. But that was also, uh, Mr. Jackson ended up buying another farm out by Lake Weddington. So my dad bought his share out. And we had like 2,500 turkeys, which was a big bunch of turkeys back then, because we had no feeders, automatic feeders or automatic waterers. And we had free-range turkeys before they were free-range turkeys. And uh, so my job was to you know, feed and water the turkeys. And actually, when they were little, we'd, I'd sleep in the turkey house to be sure the temperature was okay and no varmints came in. So I started doing it when I was just, I guess, seven or eight years old. Um. What other jobs did you work besides for your dad at the farm? Okay, the most exciting job I had, I'd re really never been away from home. And uh, so I had an aunt and uncle out in Golden, Colorado. And I was I just, my birthday's in May. And when school was out, I was 16. And uh, this friend and I decided we wanted to go to Colorado and work. And we'd, uh, work on a dude ranch and we would you know ride horses and lead girls on trail rides and take the station wagon to town and all these wonderful jobs so I talked we both talked our parents in letting us go to Colorado and like I say my aunt was in Golden so we got on a Greyhound bus and went to Golden Colorado and I'd never been to Colorado and seeing those mountains it just blew me away and uh, my friend was 18, and so we started looking for jobs, and nobody wanted to hire us. And finally, he got a job in Evergreen washing dishes, and my aunt was about ready to pack me up and send me back to Arkansas. And I'd never heard of an employment agency, but I noticed in the paper there were these things called employment agencies. So I got on a bus, went into Denver to an employment agency, and they say they said, we've got a job in Central City, Colorado, which was a little mining town uh, out west of Denver, and they had an opera house, and uh, it was really known for its uh, opera and theater. And uh, they said, we've got a job, and it's in Teller House Bar, and we need a bar boy that'll wash glasses, wash the floor, and do things like that. And I said, well, I really want it, but I better check with my parents, so I, I'll call you back tomorrow. So uh, I talked to my parents, and they said, well, sure, we, tr we trust you. This bar was actually owned by the University of Denver, uh, the whole facility, the Opera House and Teller House Hotel. And they had dozens and dozens of students that worked there. And so uh, I, I got a job as a bar boy in the Central City uh, Teller House Hotel. They had the face in the barroom floor. And my job was to w wash Madeline's face every morning. Um, tell me about 
What other chores you did when you, when you lived here in Arkansas on Kessler Mountain at your place your your parents bought? Uh, what other jobs did you do besides helping with the the business? What other chores? Well, did you we do? also uh, we had four old Guernseys and I milked them by hand, uh, and we would uh, by hor and horseback take the milk around to neighbors and sell it to them. We also sold cream to Swifts in town. So my job was milking cows. And uh, actually my, the milking room is still up there and it later became our mail order office with computers about as big as uh, this table. The discs were about this big and they had 30 megabytes of storage. <laughs> Tell me about your earliest memories of Farmington. When you first moved here, uh, what was it like here where you live? And then tell me about what you remember about Farmington. Okay, I remember first about Farmington uh, was going to Ms. McNeil's store. They had two little stores at Farmington. We get mainly we bought most of our groceries in Prairie Grove or sometimes Fayetteville, but we would go to to uh, Miss McNeil's store. That was the first first time I remember it. And then the, uh, when it was time for me to go to the first grade, it was during the Second World War, and we didn't have enough gasoline to go to any schools, and uh, we were too far to walk. So my mother homeschooled me for the first year, and uh, my sister is a year younger than I am, and she learned everything I learned, and. Uh, I think that was the first year. Next year, I went to Peabody, and uh, Mary and I both went to Peabody at the University of Arkansas. That was, I think, the first year I was ever ahead of my class because my mother was real. She always taught, so she was a very strict teacher. And the, at Peabody, they taught a rhythm band and finger painting and stuff like that. It was a teaching school. You know, the the student education t students were teachers there. Very progressive. And then uh, the fourth grade, we had to pay tuition, but we went to Farmington. And uh, so that was reading, writing, and arithmetic. That was the hardest class I think I've ever, ever had because they, no rhythm bands or finger painting. It was all reading, writing, and arithmetic. Okay. Um, what else do you remember about Farmington back in those days? What was it like? Uh, I don't really, I remember the people that I met, uh, Boyce Davis and the Blue Girls and Charlie Kate. Charlie worked for Sam Walton on the square in, in Fayetteville when we were all in high school. Charlie and I used to walk to school together. They, he lived right south of us. And then uh, when it came time to go to college, Charlie just kept working for Sam Walton. And very shortly, Charlie was a millionaire. You know, he had Walton stock when it was really. That's the main thing I remember: the people. Uh, Bob Where Mays. Some of the teachers okay. you remember? Well, I remember Mrs. Davis. Uh, she gave me a copy of Treasure Island. I remember that, and the uh, the Crouches and the Star. No, I'm sorry, the Stars. Crouches were later. The uh, Fred, Joe Fred Star. I mean, I, yeah, Joe Fred and John Larry Starr were there and their parents both taught. So I remember that distinctly. Um, what years did you go to school in Farmington? It was just the fourth grade. So I, I went to school in Farmington in the fourth grade. Uh, talk about, I know your father uh, ran the the smokehouse business before you did, and there was a time I understand that Farmington was in jeopardy of losing its post office. And let's talk about that. What happened there, and how did he help out? Well, we shipped uh, two ways. We shipped uh, Railway Express and you know, the train station on Dixon Street, and uh, depending on the destination, we would take our, some of the the turkeys to Fayetteville and then the others we'd take to Farmington. And poor Russell Broyles had to put stamps on each box, you know, calculate the weight, calculate where it was going, put stamps on it, write out a certificate. It took about five minutes for each parcel. 
and I'd bring a truckload down there, you know, and just drive Russell crazy. And uh, so anyway, uh, that was, that was, uh, and Farmington, of course, was much smaller then. And, there, and I guess they were consolidating post offices like they were schools. But I think the, uh, we shipped enough turkeys out of there that it, it sort of got over the bump until Farmington really started to grow. Um. Over the years, who are some of the people that you've gotten to know in Farmington? Actually, I don't know very many people in Farmington anymore, really. I mean, I went to school. Uh, the, when, the, after the fifth grade, uh, Farmington, I mean, we were in the Mount Zion School District. The little, that's a, right across from where Lowe's is now. And they consolidated into Fayetteville. Our south line was the division between Fayetteville and Farmington. So uh, I ended up then going to the fifth grade to uh, West Side School with Boyce Davis. And uh, so I, I went all the way through the Fayetteville school system. So I really don't, didn't, don't know too many people in Farmington. What do you remember about how the town has changed over all the years? Well, mainly it's just looking. We live up on that mountain and used to you'd look out and you'd see a light here, another light over here at night. Now it's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of houses, so, and you've got, what, Sonic and um, McDonald's and all of this, so. Uh, tell me what you remember about the Starks operation in Farmington. Well, if you do remember, just tell me your memory. I can't, I don't remember anything about it except later, uh, after I got to know Hobo Hickman and Paul Stark. And uh, I had this wild idea about growing apples down here. And Hobo said, that's not a very good place. It's too low, it, get, it would frost, and uh, you need to be up on top of a hill. And he was absolutely right. We put apples in. Roy Rome helped uh, put it in, and uh, we've got one apple tree left. So, <laughs> and Paul Stark came out and, and told us. Uh, Joanne Thomas, Ho Hobo's, uh, daughter worked for the smokehouse for years and years, Joanne Thomas. So she knew the Starks. Tell me, what was Hobo like? Hobo was, had a talent with trees. I mean, out in his yard, he would have a, an apple tree and there'd be a pear and a peach and a whatever. He, he, he would graft branches onto it. So he was just a genius on grafting and growing. And I, but again, I don't know much about it, except he ran Starks for years and years. It was a big operation. Um, when you first moved here um, at, at the Castro Mountain property here, what was it like? How, you know, between Fayetteville and Farmington, you were kind of in the middle. Uh, okay. How isolated was it out here? Well, uh, when it came time we wanted to get a telephone, we went to Prairie Grove and talked to Jim Parks, and he said, we don't have a line, but uh, you, if you run your own line, you can have a telephone. So we had one of the old crank time type telephones and uh, put it on the wall, and then we ran wires, put insulators in the trees, and ran wires down to the highway. And so that was, uh, that's how isolated we were. We went to town maybe once a week. You know, you didn't just run to town back then. And we'd go to do our laundry in Prairie Grove. They had a laundry there. And uh, like I say, we just had to be self-sufficient. We grew just about all our own food. Why would you go to Farmington or Prairie Grove to shop instead of Fayetteville? I don't know. It was, we just thought of Prairie Grove as closer I don't, it probably wasn't, but uh, we used to go to the movie in Prairie Grove, too. I mean, we would shop in, in Fayetteville, but probably about equally as much or more in Prairie Grove. Um, if somebody asked you uh, to tell them about your neighboring town of Farmington here that you've lived next to all these years, what would you tell them about the town? Hmm. Farmington has never had like a square or a center, 
of town. It's sort of a sprawl. It had some beautiful buildings, still has some beautiful buildings, but uh, of course it's a bedroom community from Fayetteville and uh, you know it's getting some restaurants and things, but uh, it's just a suburb of Fayetteville. If someone asked you to say, what is your favorite thing about Farmington, and you had to finish this sentence, my favorite thing about Farmington is, what would you tell them? Well, it's people like uh, Rick Hammond is a welder that helps me out. I mean, I take something by his place, he can fix it. And uh, I see the, if I have tractor problem, I know I can go to Don Williams and he'll, he'll take care of it. So I'd say the people. Uh, tell me more about some of the people that you've gotten to know from Farmington over the years, that maybe some of the ones that are still there. I've got a story that is not very politically correct. You may want to take it out. I mean, you're a school teacher. Or, uh, Go ahead and let's hear it. <laughs> okay. Uh, Ed Simpson was, uh, this got right out of, out of the war, he rented a little house, rent house, up uh, right above our house that my parents owned. And uh, to help pay the rent, he would help you know, milk cows and work around the farm. And he, he had been in the Navy, and he was uh, about your size, I mean, your height, and solid muscle. He'd been a, a boxer in the Navy, and had gone around all over in, in boxing matches. And uh, so anyway, Ed was up there, and the superintendent came up one day and said, we'd like for you to be the uh, principal at Farmington High School. And Ed said, well, you know, I've just started education. Uh, I don't know anything about being a principal. He said, no, we want you to be the principal at Farmington, and we'll pay you this much. Now, this is not an urban myth, because I've sat, I've sat on the porch, and Ed Simpson has told me this story. And uh, again, this was in the mid-40s, I think, right after the war, just a year or two after they had the GI Bill that you went to school on. So uh, the first day, Ed put on a coat and tie. Teachers wore coats and ties back then. And uh, all the kids, he was a little early, and all the kids were out in the playground. And uh, uh, this, I won't use any names, but uh, this great big guy came up to him and said, you're the new principal? Yeah. He said, well, you know, I ran off the last principal. And uh, Ed said, well, I think we need to settle this. So Ed sent somebody in the gym, and they got a boxing gloves. And uh, Ed said, you know, this guy would take a big swing at him, and Ed would duck, and then he said he'd hit him with a glove, just twist it enough, it'd just make a little cut. And after a minute or two, this fellow was just streaming blood. And uh, so he, he, he sent him home, and uh, his father, George, said, What'd you, what did happen? He said, well, I got in a fight. Who'd you get in a fight with? That new principal. And so George just said, you go back in, in school and you apologize to that principal. And so, uh, I better not use the name, did. And so Ed said, uh, accept the apology and said, uh, do you all have a basketball team? And uh, he, he said, no. He said, well, let's start one. And so they became bosom buddies and started the basketball. But you can imagine now what happened. There'd be lawsuits all over for a principal and a student fighting with boxing gloves. But that's a true story. Any other stories like that you can think of about Farmington that would be maybe some stuff uh, about the brawls or anything, postmasters? Talk, talk to me more about the postmaster. Did he always have to put those stamps on one at a time? Yep, yep. Were they glad that you were able to help keep giving them enough business to stay in business, or was it? I, I think he, uh, it was so much work on Russell. I think it was, and he had deadlines, get it out. I think it was a hassle for him. And then they, the next uh, postmaster was Buddy Elkins. Buddy was uh, our rural carrier for years, and uh, so it became easier. They, they got you know, a system that worked a lot better on 
nailing. And uh, and then so Buddy was just very, very disappointed when UPS started. Because, you know, UPS, back then you had to write a check. You, you couldn't, uh, you know, send, they couldn't send you a bill. And UPS would send you a bill once a month. And uh, UPS would come right to your door and pick up the packages, which the post office couldn't do. And Buddy would just fume about, you know, the post office needed to make all these changes that UPS was doing. And, uh, and then later, uh, two of Buddy's sons worked for the smokehouse, but uh, Raymond uh, ran our bakery in Fayetteville, and uh, Eugene worked in, out here. And then, of course, Raymond also worked out here later. What people over the years from Farmington have worked here? I can't remember any other than the the Elkins. I don't know. Most we had a lot of students from university that worked for us off and on, and of course Joanne Thomas. Now I take Joanne was great, and Carol Andrews. Bill, I don't know if you've interviewed Bill Andrews or not. I mean he's dead Tell now. Tell me but, about Carol. She worked here. Uh, Carol worked when we were up. The smokehouse was up behind our house from 1946 to 1976. We moved down here. I'll tell you a Joanne Thomas story. Okay, she married C.J. Thomas, and they had kids. He was in the Navy and went all over the world. And I had met Joanne at Farmington School, and then I hadn't seen her for years, you know, because she she had been away in the Navy. And uh, we, the, our office was uh, in the on the back porch of the house, and uh, Sarah needed some help, more time to you know, for, to take care of the kids <clears throat> in the house. So we decided we need to hire somebody part-time uh, on the office in our back porch. And we had a, an addressograph machine. It was an old machine you'd put metal plate in and clunk, 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 clunk. And then you'd make an impression on it. And so somehow or other I got word out that I needed somebody and Joanne came and she was all dressed up, had on heels and skirt. And uh, oh, I said, well, hey, Joanne. And, I said, I'm looking for somebody for the office. And she said, well, I'd like the job. Said, no, uh, I can't take shorthand. I said, well, that's okay. We don't need shorthand. And I can't type. Well, that's okay. You know, we don't, it's just a dress graph. And so, anyway, she told me, oh, and CJ does the checkbook. I don't do the checkbook. So she actually had no skills, but she came to work, and then she became our office manager. And, you know, as the mail order grew, in fact, she's one that had, uh, Carol come, but Joanne did a, she was just a delightful person, and she did a wonderful job in her office. Tell me, when you were a kid growing up, and uh, here between Farmington and Fayetteville, what were some of the things that you would do for fun as a kid? Okay, we'd spend hours damming up the creek, you know, walking in the woods, and then my mother would run us out uh, of the house in the morning and expect us to come in for lunch, and then back out and come in for supper. And we ride. We rode horses all over, and uh, we had. We took animals to the fair, and uh, we used to also ride. A, we'd get a whole bunch of kids together, and a and archer would be the would lead the group. We'd ride horses out to Lake Weddington, and rent a cabin out there. She would feed us, and then we'd ride horses back to Fayetteville. I used to ride horses right on Highway 62, and you can imagine now what that would be like. Actually, we moved here. The railroad ran uh, between here and the existing highway, and they were just taking up the rails here because I guess they wanted steel for the war. But the railroad, you know, ran from here all the way to Tahlequah. And actually, they're clearing land down the street, and you can see where the uh, old railroad was. And we'd haul cinders from the railroad and put it on our road. As far as fun, that was mainly horseback riding and uh, walking. And, we used to, I used to hunt a lot, squirrels mainly, and rabbits, and uh, we didn't, I didn't, we didn't do things like Boy Scouts or any of the town things, uh, the old country. Uh, what did your parents and their friends do for fun? Oh, uh, they were big bridge players, and uh, my parents enjoyed traveling, and they, after, later, uh, when my dad was like 76, they went to Europe for six months. He'd been in the Army and had space, you could travel space available on an Army ship. And uh, 
So they spent six months in, in Europe and had a great time. He, my parents were never old. They traveled. But, uh, tell me the ways and uh, tell me a little bit more about the history of your business. Um, okay, we, we talked about how the business started. Let's talk about how it ended, really. I built this building we're in in 1976. Tilted up walls and uh, our kids hauled the stone. Uh, we had a tractor and trailer. And we got, there were some old uh, rock walls that had been torn down. And that we used a small rubble to make these stone panels. Anyway, that was 1976. And then uh, I retired in 2008 and I leased the building and business to uh, somebody and uh, actually two different groups and they ran it and never could. I, I was never, I never made a lot of money on it and uh, they tried and they never did make much money or lost money so they closed in 2012. So here I have an 18,000 square foot building, solid, solid building, and stone walls, steel trusses and uh, so I have leased uh, about 4,000 square feet upstairs to a group called Fayette Chill which are outdoor outfitters and then also to the Northwest Arkansas Land Trust who uh, uh, Terry Lane grew up with, with our kids in 4-H and, uh, and I, I've known Terry all my life and the Northwest Arsenal Land Trust started in Bentonville and sort of sat there not doing much. In 2008, uh, we decided we wanted to put 20 acres between here, the smokehouse and our house, into a, a land trust and uh, put a conservation easement on it. And I looked at the Northwest Arkansas Land Trust, they had no land. I, the Ozark Regional Land Trust out of Missouri, I felt was too far away. And so uh, I talked to the city of Fayetteville, and so we had their very first conservation easement. We have 20 acres here. And I had bought that, or my parents had bought that for $50 an acre from Clyde Holland. And so we named these trails, we built trails and named them after Clyde and Nanny Holland. They were Farmington farmers and uh, delightful people. And then uh, we have uh, a 1,500 square feet uh, classroom, and we have kids come from Farmington and Fayetteville. We had 1,000 kids last year, third graders mainly, but also high school kids. And uh, they come in groups of 30 or so on a school bus, and half of them go up in the woods, and they have a little worksheet. And then half of them come inside in the classroom and study fossils. And then they switch. And then they have a picnic lunch after that. So the kids love it. We have two or three groups a week. And we have a woman out of Fayetteville that does the environmental center at Lake Fayetteville. And she does this also. And does a, Dana Smith does a great job. And Terry Lane, uh, I started telling about Terry and the land trust. When she started, she learned really a good worth ethic from 4-H. And... Uh, when she became their executive director, she, it just took off. And they now have over 2,000 acres that they uh, protect, including the 400 acres up here on top of Mount Kessler. So I'm thrilled. These, and then this room we're in now is sort of a community room. We have bluegrass. We have birthday parties. We have play readings. We have dinner parties. So it's, uh, the, the building is now used. Uh, it's, we're using just about all of it now. And what else can you tell me about it? What do you see in the future for this facility? And well, we just uh, essentially remodeled it. You know, it was a heating and air, and I think it, like I say, we put it there, we built it in 1976, so I think it should be here another 60 or 70 years, and I hope that uh, we carry on the tradition of, uh, of having, it, we call it the Kessler Mountain Nature Center and Outdoor Classroom, so I hope that continues. And like yesterday, uh, we had the, the Kess Mount Kessler run, and the, they ran a 10K and a 5K, and they started over on the regional park on the east side, and they ran over here, and then they had the big party uh, after it. They had beer booths, and they had uh, food trucks, and uh, a band, and 
So it's an entertainment center also. And uh, it's right now a very visible location because Rupal Road uh, has now joined Martin Luther King and we're right at that intersection. So it's very visible and easy to get into. So I hope we can continue to uh, make it a regional nature center. Yeah, this property wasn't really right in the middle of so visible at first, was it? No, it's, no. I mean, you've gone for your now to major intersection, but what was it like when you first got here? Well, we had a dirt road, you know, that washed out in the winter and when it rained, and then in the summer it was dusty. So they, we now live on a paved road and farming. I mean, this loan is, what, five lanes out here in front of us now. So it's quite different. I guess they'll be running buses out here for long. 